Welcome everybody. It's so great to see you all this Thursday evening. Welcome to Elisha's Home Thursday night service. Uh, until further notice, we'll be having our Facebook Live services on our regular scheduled service times, Fridays at 7 p.m., Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Dr. Pegg will share a message on Thursday nights like tonight. Pastor Tim and I will be rotating our message, so he'll be here next Thursday night. Uh, please like and share to your Facebook page and uh, to a friend's page maybe. Invite them to uh, listen. Uh, at the end of the uh, the video, you'll also have a chance to watch it many more times or share it with other friends. We also have a link to the previous sermons that have been uploaded to you to YouTube, which will be, which will be shared in the comments section at the end of the message. So after I'm done and and this has all been recorded and saved, I will put that link into the um, uh, the for the YouTube video on the comments area somewhere in that area. Let's see. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, feel free to put them in the chat uh, area or on the comment area, and we'll check and pray for them. Uh, if you want to support the ministry, there's PayPal account at www.elishashome.com, or send a check to Elisha's Home and Ministries, 11 Climus Road, Monteros, PA, 18801. And uh, tonight, you know, there's there's just so much going on in the world. You hear all the negative things going on, and I know it's a challenge. I've heard so much. I've had so many friends dealing with so many things, and I, I just I know it's so easy to lose our focus. Even the world is saying that everybody's focus is on the virus and all this other stuff, and and more and more the Lord just keeps telling me we all need to hunker down. We need to study the scriptures. We need to jump into a, a, a closer walk with the Lord, not not push him away and not push our family away, but instead spend quality time with the Lord and and with our close friends I mean Facebook I'm impressed it's do, it's doing so well at keeping everybody online uh, up here in Northeast Pennsylvania we're blessed in a way a lot of people say we're not but I know in the bigger cities Facebook especially on Sunday morning they're overwhelmed by all the churches that are online so again we are blessed to be here I love Northeast Pennsylvania we can get up and walk around I mean our nearest neighbors oh 200 yards away and and uh, as a whole most everybody lives a half a mile away from us so it's not bad at all so I'd like to just open up with prayer father thank you and we praise you for bringing us here safely tonight we thank you Lord that 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 the virus is slowing down people are being healed father God that people are not getting sick friends and family members and and close um, relatives of this ministry are not getting sick they will be healed and well in the name of Jesus and Father God this is going to be a time we're just claiming a time of growing in our faith and growing closer to you and not going away from you growing closer to family and just re-looking at our priorities we just thank you and praise you for this time in Jesus name Amen well this evening I want to touch on six important words that should make you evaluate your walk I, I'll warn you ahead of time, I'm not the standard preacher. I like to uh, go off the cuff sometimes. I just, I enjoy uh, talking to people, and it is kind of strange talking to myself in the, in the camera, but I am getting used to it. Uh, tonight, the six words I want to uh, challenge you with is, and you've heard some of these before, it's faith, trust, hope, confidence, love, and attitude. And you say, well, that's pretty well, that sounds, you know, very biblical. And, and a well-known scripture that everybody goes to in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I love that scripture. It means so much to me. But let me share something I found just a few days ago. And many of these statements or short stories that I have shared in the past with other sermons connected with other stories. But I, I really like how the person put this together. They said six short stories with more meaning than you realize. There's a story about once all the villagers decided to pray for rain. On the day of the prayer, all the people gathered, but only one boy came with the umbrella. That's faith. When you throw babies in the air, they laugh because they know you will catch them. That's trust. 
Every night we go to bed without any assurance of being alive the next morning, but still we set the alarms to wake up. That's hope. Do you realize you're walking in hope and you don't even realize it when you set that alarm? We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. That's confidence. We see the world suffering, but still we get married, we have children. That's love. An old man's shirt was, and I love this, an old man's shirt was written, on it was written a sentence, I am not 80 years old, I am sweet 16, with 64 years of experience. That's attitude. Do you walk out? with these six do you walk it out do you walk your faith out with these six nouns do you, just think about it for a moment faith trust hope confidence and love something to think about now I already said first Corinthians 13 covered maybe three of the six um, that Paul in Paul's writings you know, Paul was known to be one of the greatest apostles because he really walked in faith trust hope confidence love attitude boldness I mean there were so many nouns and adjectives that would describe who Paul was and so I'd like you if you have your Bibles with you if not I'm gonna read from the New King James Version and International Version once in a while and also the Amplified but I want you to go to Hebrews 11 starting in verse 1 going to verse 3 and I like the subtitle faith in action and, and that's something that we've learned here at the ministry years ago if your faith isn't put to action what good is it so anyway Hebrews 11 1 now faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen now it's interesting that's one of the very first scriptures I ever memorized but the next part next three two verses are so important for by it the elders obtained a good testimony by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible the things that were seen were not made of the things which were visible I'll, I'll go on here you'll get an idea what this is see God spoke the invisible into visible do you understand that so this is something a side note I always like to tell people another scripture that I learned and I real I finally understood when I started hanging out with um, some very excited individuals about 35 years ago and the well he he said I serve and I, I started to realize so what are you talking about he said I serve a God who speaks those things that aren't as though they were and he said the earth I said what are you talking about and remember the scripture we just read he spoke those things that were invisible which were visible hmm so it says so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible you understand now, now Romans 4 17 it talks about as it is written I have made you the father of many nations he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not he calls it he's God spoke that and everybody goes well that's just God well see God tells us all through the scriptures that Jesus came to set the example Jesus said hey you know the father's in me and I am in the father I only do what the father tells me to do and so Christ was our example of who Jesus was and should be in our life and in that Romans 4 17 when I heard that somebody said well look at Lazarus I said oh because he said to Martha Martha he's sleeping and Martha goes wait a minute no he stinks he's dead he's been there four days and he goes okay I know that he's dead and basically you know Jesus said he was sleeping and he's finally said yeah I know he's dead as you would think but really he's just sleeping and what did he do he called forth Lazarus and I, I love one pastor he goes well you notice he didn't say come forth because think of everybody in those tombs would have came forth he said Lazarus come forth so I love Romans 4 17 uh, Hebrews 11 uh, 1 through 3 but in the Amplified Hebrews and I know I'm not supposed to lick my fingers and touch my mouth but I've already washed my hands so don't anybody write me nasty letters 
Hebrews 11.1 1 in the Amplified says, Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things that are hoped for, that are divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen. The conviction of their reality, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Verse 2, For by this kind of faith, men of old gained approval. Now you notice the one scripture in the New King James said, by faith, it says, For by the elders obtained a good testimony. Well, that good testimony wasn't for men. It was the approval of God. Verse 3 in the Amplified says, By faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. We understand that the worlds, the universe, ages, were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. Now, everybody thinks, oh, it's just written word. No, God spoke it. And it goes on to say in the rest of that verse in the Amplified, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which were or which are visible. So God spoke nothingness into something. So now in the Passion, Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. And again, th these are powerful scriptures, and you notice something. These are really, all these scriptures are covering the other three of the six words that I had mentioned. And the subtitle in the Passion calls it, The Power of Bold Faith. Now, and it goes on to verse 1. Now, faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Now into verse 4. Faith moved Abel to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to offer God than his brother Cain, and God declared him righteous because of his offering of faith. By his faith, Abel still speaks instructions to us today, even though he is long dead. Verse 5, Faith lifted Enoch from this life, and he was taken up into heaven. He never had to experience death. He just disappeared from the world because God promoted him. For before he was translated to the heavenly realm, his life had become the pleasure to God. He never died. God just took him. Verse 6. And without faith, living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real, and that he rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength into seeking him. So, what pleases God? Faith. Simple. I mean, just simple faith. And you must believe that God exists. And people say, well, it's kind of hard. Look around you, people. God is powerful. And the design, what a great designer. I mean, honestly, I used to, I still love to take pictures. And I, I believe my, my youngest son, he's, he's really grabbed that, that ability to take some beautiful pictures. How could that just happen? It couldn't just happen. So remember, Paul usually spoke with all of those nouns. The faith, the trust, the hope, the confidence, the love, attitude. But are there other Bible references other than Paul and, and maybe Peter? Because you know I've told you this before. Peter was one of my, one of my favorite apostles. He was a go-getter. Uh, I was a lot like him. I'm, I'm a lot like him sometimes. Um, my mouth would speak before my brain, but once he got filled with the Holy Ghost, he did a lot better. So anyway, some other Bible references. In Daniel chapter 3, and most of you know this story, starting in verse 13, it talks about um, three young men that would not bow down. And I'll, I'll read it from the NIV. It says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of God I have set up? 
Verse 15, And now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And I always warn people, be very cautious about mocking God. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King, now get ready, there's some confidence, there's boldness here, uh, there's trust, there's faith. And this is what, he, what they say, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. So they were still respectful, but they were bold and confident that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than the usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound. Now remember, they were bound by some of the strongest men in the, in the area and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Well, you know the rest of the story. King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, well, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around that fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing uh, of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, come out here. And so Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire and their satraps, pre uh, prefects, governors, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. But you notice their robes were burned off because those were not of, they were not of God, they were not theirs. Verse 28, the Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to rescue the servants. They trusted in him, and they defied with confidence the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their house be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. And then, he, then they were promoted, it says. So check that out. Isn't that powerful? See what God can do when you know who you are, you know your God, and you're confident in your God. And even if it doesn't work out like you expect, you're confident that you know where you're going to go. Another example, 2 Kings 6.15 says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, now I believe it was Elijah, I want to say Elijah's servant, went up out early that next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded them. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked him. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Oh yeah, it was Elisha. And Elisha, verse 17, prayed. And I love this because how often you know, do we speak from what we see around us? You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not, it's not what we see. It's what we believe and what we've received. And often people will just say all around them, gloom, despair, and agony on me. You know the old hee-haw song, uh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Now, what a thing to confess. That is the opposite of what the Word says. The Word, the word says He's always with us. He gives us joy and peace. His mercies are new every morning. I mean, there's scripture after scripture that says the opposite of that. And But you know what? 
the scriptures say that your words will never come back void. God's word will go out to do what it's supposed to do. So if you sit there and say gloom, despair, and agony on me, you're going to have gloom, despair, and agony. You're, it's going to be that way. But if you begin to change your words, you'll begin to change things in your life. Uh, a good example, maybe I shared this last, last Friday night. I don't remember. But um, Pastor Robert Morris shared a really neat story about uh, a young man that came to him and said, You know, Pastor, I have a problem. And he said, well, what's your problem? He said, I can't, I can't stop smoking. I cannot stop smoking. And he said, well, he said, son, he said, I tell you what, every time you go to smoke, have anything to do with the cigarettes, I want you to say, I'm set free from, um, from cigarettes, from nicotine. I'm set free from it. He goes, but I'm bound by it. He goes, no, 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 don't, don't say that. He goes, so you're telling me, even if I'm smoking a cigarette, I keep, spe every time I think about it, I say, I am set free from this. I am, I've overcome this. I've overcome this in the name of Jesus. Yeah, he said, just keep saying that. So for two weeks, he hadn't seen this guy. He comes back to church, and he's jumping up and down. He's all excited, and he said, you're not going to believe this? He said, I have been set free. I'm sitting on the side of the corner, and all of a sudden, these um, people are looking at me funny because I finally got the revelation that, guess what? I am set free. And a lot of times, we just have to convince ourselves. We have to have confidence in what God says. We have confidence. So Elisha prayed because he knew he knew in the spiritual realm that we wrestle not in, in Ephesians 6, I believe, 11 and 12. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. So he realized that there's a whole spiritual world around us that we don't quite understand or we might not be able to see. And so Elisha prayed, open his eyes. He meant his spiritual eyes. He said, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow, that's a powerful story, isn't it? So Elisha spoke with boldness. Remember when it was, I believe it was Elisha. I get Elisha and Elijah mixed up sometimes. But remember when uh, that captain of the guard who had leprosy came to him? And uh, he said, well, I hear that you can heal me. What do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to go dip into the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. And, he, and the guy got prideful and mad. He said, you know what? We have cleaner rivers where I live. Why would I want to go dunk in the dirty Jordan River? And uh, the guy was disobedient and rebellious. And he, he was just going to die of leprosy. And, and, the, and the servant, who happened to be a, a Jew that had been uh, taken slave, said to him, you know, this prophet, he's, he knows what's going on. He's, he's with it. He's, he usually is right on. So he went back and he apologized and he dipped seven times and he was completely healed of the leprosy. So it's interesting, you know, you can be bold and confident in who you are, but people not, might not necessarily receive what you have to say. But there comes that one part where it says love, giving it in love, telling the truth in love. So we all should have a story. Pastor Tim preached on this a couple of years ago, and every once in a while he would have somebody come up and give a testimony of what God had done in their life. And we all should have a story to tell. Daily God is using you and I, whether you know or not. He's working through us, giving us examples. Are we listening for those things? Are we actually realizing that God is going to use us in a powerful way? Do you get excited? See, I do. I, I love it when, when, I hate to quote Mr. T or, you know, the A-team. I love it when a plan comes together. Well, I love it when God's plan comes together. It just, to me, it's exciting to see how things fall into place. So I want to share a few stories of, of people in the past who have had boldness. Uh, they, they had love. They had confidence, trust, hope. And all of it stems in the relationship with the Lord. Anyway, a great man of God, his name was Hudson Taylor, went to China. He made the voyage on a sailing vessel. As it turned, as it neared the channel between the southern Malay Pencil, Pen, Pennsylvania, that's really good, Malay Peninsula and the island of Sumatra, the missionary heard an urgent knock on the stateroom door. He opened it, and there stood the captain of the ship. Mr. Taylor, he said, we have no wind. We are drifting toward an island where the people are heathens, and I fear they are cannibals. Well, what can I do, asked Taylor. I understand that you believe God. 
He has confidence and trust in God. I want you to pray for wind. All right, Captain, I will, but you must set the sail. Now, it's interesting. Remember, faith, there's action in faith. So this guy had faith that Taylor's prayer would be answered. Don't you love it? older I get, the more my voice cracks like a teenager. Anyway, so he says, I'll... <laughs> I love this. So he, he said this, I'll pray for wind. All right, Captain, I will, but you must set the sail. Why? That's ridiculous. There's not even the slightest breeze. Besides, the sail, sailors will think I'm crazy. To set the sail is to prepare the sail, open it up to catch the wind. And they don't normally do that until the wind starts. So anyway, but finally, because of Taylor's insistence, he agreed. Forty-five minutes later, he returned and found the missionary still on his knees. You can stop praying now, said the captain. We've got more wind than we know what to do with. Now, is that confidence or what? You just keep praying, you keep believing, you stand on the promise. And that's something that uh, many people in this community come to realize, that uh, we will pray for you until, you until you're either healed, set free, or you go home to be with the Lord. We're not going to believe anything else. We want to be there for you. We, we walk in faith. And uh, people say, well, that's false hope. I would rather have somebody give me hope than be negative and just basically bury me before the time. So here, here's another interesting, um, now the last one, so we could say Hudson Taylor's story was on faith in action. And here's the illustration concerning attitude. I love this. A chaplain was speaking to a soldier on a cot in a hospital. You have lost an arm in the great cause, he said. No, said the soldier with a smile. I didn't lose it. I gave it. In the same way, Jesus did not lose his life. He gave it pur pers purposefully. Now think about that. He gave it purposely. That, that's, that's attitude. How about confidence? Here's a story about confidence. John McKay of the NFL tells a story illustrating the supreme confidence. And this is, any of you duck hunters, you're going to love this. Confidence of the University of Alabama football coach Bear Bryant. He said, we were out shooting ducks and finally after about three hours, here comes one lonely duck. The bear, I guess that was his nickname, the bear fires and that duck is still flying today. But Bear watched that duck flap away. He looked at me and he said, John, you are witnessing a genuine miracle. There flies a dead duck. Now is that confidence? He had total confidence that he hit that duck. I know this sounds kind of silly, but sometimes our, our confidence in the Lord might seem silly to peep other people. But you know what? What matters is God knows your heart. He knows my heart. How about trusting? Much like the early story on trust, Tim Hansel shares a simple but true story. He said, one day while my son Zach and I were out in the country climbing around in some cliffs, I heard a voice from above me yell, hey dad, catch me. I turned around to see Zach joyfully jumping off a rock straight at me. He had jumped and then yelled, Hey, Dad! I became an instant circus act, catching him. We both fell to the ground, and for a moment after I caught him, I could hardly talk. When I found my voice again, I gasped in, ex ex hmm. in um, excitement or fear. He said, Zach, can you give me one good reason? why he did that. See, I can, I can picture that. He responded with remarkable calmness, remarkable calmness. Sure, because you're my dad. His whole assurance was based on the fact that his father was trustworthy. He could live life to the hilt because I could be trusted. Isn't that even more true for us Christians? Shouldn't we trust God? Because he's our spirit. He's our dad. You know, he is the father to the fatherless. He is God. He is powerful. He is the almighty God. So to me, that's, that's just exciting. How about love? This is an interesting story about love. Now, I've heard other stories kind of like this, but a newspaper column, columnist and minister, George Crane, tells of a wife who came into his office full of hatred toward her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even and before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has me. But isn't that interesting? Boy, a lot of people have that kind of attitude. 
So Dr. Crane, or the, and, the, and remember he was a minister too, suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Hmm. Go out of your way to be as kind and considerate and generous as possible. Spare no effort to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love and, and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled and exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm, acting as if for two months she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, re uh, reinforcing, sharing. Uh, when she didn't return, Crane called, Are you ready to go through with that divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed. Never. I discover I really do love him. Her actions had changed her feelings. Motion resulted in emotion. The ability to love is established not so much by fervent promise as often repeated deeds. You know, we say we love God, but do we really? Do we walk it out? You know, do we, we say we love other people, but do we really? Do we, do we walk out our, our love that we have? So here's another one on hope. As Vice President George Bush represented the U.S. at the funeral, and I remember this, uh, the former Soviet leader Lin, uh, Bre Brezhnev, oh my gosh, hmm, you know who I'm talking about. Anyway, Bush was deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev. That's it, Brezhnev's went widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. Then just as the soldiers touched the lid, she, uh, his wife performed an act of great courage and hope, a gesture that must surely rank as one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There in the citadel of the secular atheist power, the wife of the man who had run it all hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that there was another life. And that that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross. And that the same Jesus might yet have mercy on her husband. Now we don't know. We don't know if he knew the Lord right before he died or not. But she did. So finally, interesting challenge. In James 1, to 25. And I, I hear people say, I hear people say this a lot. Don't just be the church, you know, uh, walk it out or do the church but you know James 1 to 25 says but be doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving yourself be not just hearers only for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And that's the New King James. And I thought about that many, many years ago when I first became a Christian. I didn't realize that you had to live every day of your life as a Christian. I just didn't make sense to me. I thought, okay, you know, if I go to church and I put a little bit of money, I throw a dollar or two into the, the offering, um, and I'm good to the preacher on Sunday, I can live like hell for the next six days. I mean, the first couple of years I got saved, I would, man, I bear, if I made it to church, it was usually with a hangover. And I, that is not, I'm not bragging about it. That's not a godly thing. But nobody taught me what I, the basics. Nobody encouraged me to read the Word. And it's a sad thing. So trust me, I talk to people about it. And uh, I just, I, and I, I don't cram it down their throat. But, uh, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty bold about how we need to live seven days a week for Christ. And and do I blow it once in a while? Of course I do. But you know, the Lord says, dig into the Word, and the more you read the Word, the stronger you'll be, the more you'll become like Him. Now here's the final story that I just I have to read, because, um, well, the guy I'm going to read it about, it, you'll, you'll, you'll see why. One of my favorite actors, John Wayne. And somebody told me he actually owned a farm around here at one time, here in the Montrose area. 
John Wayne was a big fan of Reverend Robert Schuller, an American Christian televangelist who was famous for his weekly Hour of Power TV program from the 70s, uh, 1970 to 2000, or 2010, I think it was. On one of his programs, the Duke heard Dr. Schuler say his daughter Cindy had been in a terrible motorcycle accident and had to have her leg amputated. John Wayne wrote a note to her saying, Dear Cindy, I'm sorry to hear about your accident. Hope you will be all right. And he signed it, John Wayne. The note was delivered to her and she read it immediately. Then she decided she wanted to write, a John, write John Wayne a personal note in reply. She wrote, Dear Mr. Wayne, I got your note. Now, I, well, that's a gutsy girl right there. She said, I got your note. Thanks for writing me. I like you very much. I'm going to tell, I'm going to be all right because Jesus is going to help me. Mr. Wayne, do you know Jesus? I sure hope you know Jesus, Mr. Wayne, because I cannot imagine heaven being complete without John Wayne being there. I hope if you don't know Jesus that you will give your heart to Jesus right now. See in heaven, and she signed her name. So that there is more to the story. Cindy put that letter in an envelope, sealed it, and wrote across the front of it, John Wayne. When a visitor came to her room to see her, and remember, you got to remember, Robert Schuller is a very well-known man. Uh, <laughs> so when a visitor came to her room to see her, he said, What are you doing? She said, I just wrote a letter to John Wayne, but I don't know how to get it to him. He said, That's funny. I'm going to have dinner with John Wayne tonight at the Newport Club down at Newport Beach. Give it to me. I'll give it to him. She gave him the letter and put it in his coat, in his coat pocket. There were 12 people that night, all sitting around the table for dinner. They were laughing and cutting up, and, and this guy happened to reach into his pocket and felt the letter, and he remembered it. So John Wayne was seated at the end of the table, so the guy took the letter out, and he said, Hey, Duke, I was in uh, Reverend Schuler's daughter's room today. And she wrote you a letter and wanted me to give it to you. Here it is. They passed it down to John Wayne and he opened it. They kept on laughing and, they, and cutting up and someone happened to look over at John Wayne. He was crying. One of them asked, hey Duke, what's the matter? He said, and, and can't you hear him saying it? I want to read you this letter. And he read it out loud. Then he began to weep again. He folded the letter. He put it in his pocket. Then he pointed to the man who delivered it to him and he said, You go tell that little girl right now in this, rest, uh, in this restaurant right here, John Wayne gives his heart to Jesus Christ and I will see her in heaven. Three weeks later, John Wayne died. You simply never know how giving witness to another person may affect their eternity. So you think about that for a minute. You might change one person's life and the next day, the next week, they might give their, they might, you know, go home to be with the Lord. Or you held off and you didn't say something and you were supposed to. And that person didn't go home to be with the Lord. He went somewhere else or she went somewhere else. It's really something to, to think about. And I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on you, but I'm that, telling you, we, we have a lot to do before Jesus comes. There's going to be a lot of things happening. And we need to be strong. And the only way you get strong is by digging into the Word, worshiping, praying, spending time with the Lord, like-minded fellowship. And there's just so much more. But you have to get off your butt and you got to do something. You've got to do these things for the Lord. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Anybody who really loves their spouse, they want to they wanna do things for their spouse because they love them, not because they're required. And God wants us that way. He doesn't want us to be puppets. He wants us to love him and to, just to be there with him. So I want to close today, just close in prayer. And, and I just, I'm encouraged. I'm getting, I'm getting more and more time with the Lord uh, in study, mainly because I'm tired of watching the news. I don't know about you. All the negative news, I'm tired of it. So I'm, I'm studying more. I'm actually watching more of my favorite preachers and teachers. And if, if you have a TV and you can do that, great. Otherwise, just dig into the Word some more. So anyway, let me close in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you that you never change. It says in the Scriptures that you change us not. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I am so thankful for that. I'm also thankful that you forgive me for my shortfalls and that you love us all so much that you want us all to be with you. If there's anybody out there that... 
like John Wayne, that had never received Christ and believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth that Jesus was Lord. You know, today could be that day. Today could be the day that you say, you know, Jesus, I understand that you died for my sins. By your stripes I am healed. But your blood was shed for me as, that, as the last sacrifice. Come into my life, come into my heart and change me. That's all you got to say. You don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to jump up and down and do jumping jacks. You just got to believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, tell somebody that you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Write us a message. Send me a personal message on this, whatever you want to do. But now is the time for you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So anyway, uh, next our next service will be, today is Thursday, will be tomorrow night. Pastor Tim will be preaching. And Sunday morning at 10, I will be. So get ready. God is moving. And he's moving up here on Freedom Mountain. Get ready. That virus has to die and go back to hell where it came from. God bless and take care, everybody. God is good, and his mercies will always, always be there. His, he loves you and I so, so much.